We're now ready to define the dynamic bicycle model. And in this lecture, we're only going to look at the most basic form of this dynamic bicycle model that considers lateral wheel slip. Before we start, let's first look at the dynamics of a point and then of a rigid body. Let's first look at a single 3D point with mass m in a 3D space. And let's look at the translatory motion of that point. Let r, this vector here with the dashed line, denote the location of that 3D point. And let vp at time t denote its velocity and ap at time t its acceleration. The linear momentum of p is defined as pp at time t equals the mass of that point times um, the velocity at time t. And now by Newton's second law, this is where um, dynamics comes into the play. We have the time derivative of the linear momentum of that point at time t equals the mass times the acceleration at time t and that equals the net forces that act on that point mass p which is similar the sum which is equal to the sum of all forces acting on that point mass p and that's illustrated here so the sum of all forces <clears throat> in other words the net force acting on that point mass p is equal to m times a and that's newton's second law very famous <laughs> law in physics. Now let's consider the translatory motion of a rigid body instead. So we consider this rigid body here on the right illustrated in black with a, the rigid body here has a mass m. And now let r again denote the position but in this case the position of the center of gravity c of that rigid body b. And let vc denote the velocity and ac the acceleration at the center of gravity of that rigid body. The linear momentum of B is defined as PB of T equals M times the velocity at the center of gravity of T. Similar to before, now with respect to the center of gravity. The center of gravity of a rigid body behaves like a point mass with mass M. And this of all forces act on that point, on that center of gravity point, which means that the time derivative of the linear momentum of that rigid body is equal to m times the acceleration at the center of gravity, which is equal to all the net forces that act on that rigid body B, which is the sum of all forces acting on the rigid body B. Now this is for translatory motion. However, in the case of the rigid body, because it's, it's not a point, but it has an extent and it has a, a mass distribution. So it's not all the mass is centered on a, a very small point, like in the, in the point case, but it's, it's really an object. Um, we have to consider also the rotary motion, the rotatory motion of that rigid body. So for the rotatory motion, also the geometric shape of the rigid body B and the spatial distribution of its mass is important. And that's illustrated here on the right. Let rho denote the body mass density function, where you can consider this little incremental mass element here to be a little tiny element of that rigid body and we define this as the mass at that point over a little spatial extent like this blue box here. So the overall mass of that rigid body is of course the integral over the rigid body of that density function which we simply substitute through this shorthand notation dm. This is this um, incremental um, mass of that rigid body. Now we define a quantity that's called the inertia tens tensor of B. And that is defined as this matrix here, where its entries are defined as the moments of inertia 
as here and the moments of deviation here on the right hand side. And that's just the definition that we have to take for granted for now, but it becomes useful on the next slide. So it's a definition uh, based on the body density mass distribution. Let's consider now the rotatory, rotatory motion of a rigid body. Let omega be the vector of angular velocities. So omega is a vector omega x, omega y, omega c, and it's illustrated in orange here. Again, we have the rigid body with the center of gravity, and now we have this vector of angular velocities where the rigid body rotates around that vector and the amount of or the velocity, the rotational velocity is equal to the magnitude of that vector. That's how you could imagine that. The angular momentum LC of the rigid body is now simply given by the product of the inertia tensor from before times that angular velocity vector omega and so we have a three by three matrix multiplied with a free vector which is again a three dimensional vector and that's illustrated by this red vector here which is the vector for the angular momentum lc now um, similar to the linear motion now for the rotatory motion we can apply the angular momentum principle and that tells us that the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to the inertia tensor times the angular acceleration, which is equal to the net moments of all forces acting on the rigid body B, which is equal to the sum of all moments acting on B with respect to the center of gravity as illustrated here on the right. And that means, well, what is the moment? The moment is simply the product of the lever arm length times the force that is applied in that direction here on the rigid body. So in this case, if we apply these three forces, we have to multiply this force with this length here and this force here with this length and this force with this length. And then we get the three moments that we have to sum up to obtain the net moment. And that is simply the time derivative of the angular momentum LC. Okay. <laughs> now, the, in uh, some cases, things simplify, and that's also what we consider here. We consider a much simpler case. So, if we consider a canonical coordinate system, for example, if the body frame is chosen such that the principal axis system for the rigid body. Um, um, uh, which is the symmetry axis. So the body frame is equal to the principal axis or the symmetry axis. Um, the inertia tensor is diagonal. And two examples are illustrated here on the right, where in the first case, this cuboid is aligned with the body frame. And so we have this much simpler inertia tensor here, which is diagonal. And similarly for the uh, this wheel-like um, rigid body here on on the lower part of the figure. For the planar motion of a rigid body in the xy plane, as we consider the vehicle to live in, the um, angular velocity in x and y direction are of course zero. And so are also the moments. And therefore, the angular momentum becomes a simple scalar quantity. So we have um, the angular momentum as a scalar um, equal to the inertia times, um, so this is this um, moment of inertia here, IC, times the angular velocity around the C axis at time t. And the angular momentum principle yields then also the scalar equation IC times omega dot um, equals the sum of all moments. 
Okay, so with this, let's now go back to our vehicle model. Let's go back to our bicycle model and let's define the dynamic bicycle model that considers forces and wheel slip. Again, we consider the model where we have a front steering angle, delta, but we don't have a back steering angle, which means that the back wheel is aligned with the vehicle orientation. For this very simple version of the dynamic bicycle model, which is probably the simplest version that we can define, we make several strong assumptions. The first assumption is, as we made already before, that the vehicle's motion is restricted to the XY plane. We are looking at the vehicle from above, bird's eye view, and we're just modeling it in the XY plane. Further, the vehicle is considered as a rigid body. Only lateral tire forces are applied, generated by a linear tire model. So we don't model here longitudinal tire forces, just the lateral tire forces. And we also assume a small steering angle, delta, such that sine of delta is approximately delta and tangent of delta is approximately delta and cosine of delta is approximately one. And we also assume a constant longitudinal velocity Vx for the simple model. So the velocity Vx doesn't change, it's constant. So given all these assumptions, let's now go ahead and define the equations. Let's try to define the equations for simulating a vehicle by considering also the forces applied to the tires. The first thing we're going to consider is the lateral dynamics, the linear dynamics. And this is, as we've seen before, um, through Newton's second law, m a y, this is the, in, in, in this direction here, in the lateral direction, is equal to the sum of all forces that act on that vehicle. And in this case, we have forces through these two tires, because this is where the tire, uh, the vehicle touches the ground. So we have the rear wheel plus the force, the force at the rear wheel plus the force at the front wheel, which is, uh, we have the sum of these two here. But the front force here is um, defined lateral to that wheel, and that wheel has a steering angle, which is not the case for the back wheel, but for the front wheel. So we need to multiply this with cosine delta, but because assume that delta is small, this can be approximated with one, so we still get fr plus ff in this simple approximation. So may is equal to fr plus ff. Similarly, uh, the acceleration can also be defined as the time derivative of the velocity of the vehicle in y direction. And in this case, because the vehicle is also rotating, the rigid body is rotating with a um, angular velocity omega, we also need to consider the so-called centripetal acceler uh, acceleration, which is omega times Vx um, for this acceleration in this direction here, because the vehicle is not going straight, but it's rotating. So if we now combine these two, if we plug this one into here, we get this expression. m times the time derivative of the velocity of the vehicle in y in lateral direction plus the um, angular velocity of that vehicle times the velocity in x direction equals fr plus ff applied at these tires. This is the first fundamental equation that we have derived for the dynamic bicycle model. The second equation that we're gonna derive is for the yaw dynamics. This is the rotational component. Here we have looked at the translational component. Now we're gonna look at the rotation. And here we have um, the relationship from before that now in this two-dimensional projection, the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration equals the sum of all moments of the forces that apply 
on the vehicle. And in this case, one of these moments is this uh, is generated through this force here times this lever arm, which is LR. So we have minus LR, FR, because that force acts in the opposite direction of that um, angular velocity vector in orange here. And we have plus LF, this lever arm, times the force acting on the front wheel. And here we have a plus because this is acting in the same direction as the velocity, the angular velocity of the vehicle. Now, of course, again, we have to consider cosine delta because we assume delta to be small, we ignore this term. And so we get IC times omega dot equals minus LR FR plus LF FF, the second fundamental equation that we have derived for the dynamic bicycle model. Now, let's look at the tire forces again. From the previous unit, we know that in the beginning of, of the curve that we have considered, the forces are linear. And so they are linear um, they are linear as they are the product of a corner, cornering stiffness factor, CR, for the rear wheel, and alpha R. And because here we have defined the forces in the opposite direction as before, opposite, in this case, the same direction as the velocity that we consider, um, uh, we uh, have to apply a minus sign here. So that's why we have a minus here. So FR is proportional to the cornering uh, stiffness and alpha R, but we have this minus here. So FR equals minus CR times alpha R, which is the rear wheel slip angle. Now this is approximately minus uh, CR tangents of alpha R for small alpha Rs. And so we can replace this expression uh, by VB y, the velocity at this rear wheel in y direction, divided by the velocity in x direction. And similarly for a front wheel, um, we have minus cf, the cornering stiffness of the front wheel, times alpha f, the slip angle of the front wheel, how much the velocity direction of the, at the front wheel a deviates from the orientation of the front wheel. And so again, if we plug in the tangents of alpha f as an approximation, we get v a eta over v a xi. Now, what are these velocities? Well, um, at the rear wheel, it's simple because the rear wheel is facing into the direction of the vehicle. We have simply for v b y, we have the velocity uh, for v b x, we have the velocity in x direction and for VBY, we have the velocity in Y direction. This is the translational component. And then we also have to consider the rotational component, which is the um, um, angular accelerate, uh, the angular velocity of that vehicle times the lever arm, LR. And we have a negative sign here um, because we are moving in the opposite direction with this velocity compared to this one here. And similarly for the front wheel, if you consider the coordinate system x and y, which is not shown here, but is similar to this one here, then this vector here, or this velocity vector project onto this coordinate system is simply vx and also v, uh, vay is vy plus in this case, because we're on the opposite side now, the lever arm lf um, times omega. So we have also the translation and the rotation component here for that velocity in y direction. This is this vector here. Now, of course, we are not interested in these two, but we're interested in v a eta and v a xi. And so we can transform um, v a x and v a y into this coordinate system that is actually shown here and that we're interested in through a simple transformation that just depends, this is a rotation here, as you can see, that just depends on the front steering angle delta. And now we again make our simplifications through assuming that this 
front steering wing, uh, angle delta is small, so cosine is approximately one and sine is approximately delta. Okay, so now we can uh, plug it, this expression into here and this expression into here. And so we get a closed expression for the force at the rear wheel and the force at the front wheel. And this is what we get. It's just plugging in these equations. And what we do here for the front wheel in addition is we assume that the velocity in this direction is much larger than the velocity in this direction, which is typically the case. And also because the front steering angle delta is small, then this term basically becomes negligible compared to this term, so we can ignore it. And so this, this term here simplifies a little bit. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we are going to take these two, fr and ff, and we are going to plug them into the formulas that we have, the fundamental formulas for the dynamic bicycle model that we have derived before for the yaw dynamics and for the lateral dynamics, where on the right hand side we have fr and ff here, and also here we have fr and ff here. And if we do so, we get these two expressions. Um, yeah, that's there's nothing more to it than just plugging plugging it in, and uh, to simplify or to highlight um, that these are indeed the expressions from before. I have put these brackets under the equ uh, equations and um, denoted them by fr and ff at the respective places. Now this is the simple, the most simple form of the dynamic bicycle model, and we can rewrite this actually into a nicer form, which we call the state space representation, where the state is the velocity of the vehicle in y direction, and the heading angle of the vehicle and the angular velocity of the vehicle. And so by rewriting the expressions from before in this format, we have now a relationship that relates the time derivative of the state vector to the state vector itself, plus a vector times the input, which in this case is simply, simply the steering angle delta of the vehicle. And now we can simulate the vehicle. We know how the velocity in y direction changes and also how the heading angle changes and the angular velocity changes um, if we apply a steering wheel, uh, if we apply a sequence of uh, steering wheel angles, um, for example, in a time discretized version of this model. And this state space representation can also be augmented by the global position, but then this becomes a nonlinear state space model. So it's not as nice anymore. So this is the, the nicest form, I would say, but it's in the local vehicle frame coordinates. Well, that's it. <laughs> so in summary, what have we learned today? We have learned that a vehicle can be modeled as a rigid body. It's subject to holonomic and non-holonomic constraints. And we have also learned that the bicycle model approximates the vehicle using two wheels. We've seen that the kinematic bicycle model assumes no wheel slip, so it's only a good model for low speeds. However, modeling tires requires to consider slip, as we've seen in the drifting example with the race car. We've also seen that sliding friction is smaller than static friction, so we should always make sure that we're in the static part of the curve, in the linear part. So we want to operate in the static friction area of the force curve. We've also seen that the circle of forces tells us that the lateral and the longitudinal forces are dependent. And if we apply a very strong lateral force, for example, we can't apply a longitudinal force anymore and vice versa. And then finally, in the last unit, we've, we've seen the dynamic bicycle model, which also takes into account tire forces and wheel slip to some degree. Thanks. <laughs>